based on willpower, of course, it makes imminent logic. We have all this energy up in space, and we need it here, and it's shining all the time, and we just have to figure out how to get it down to the surface at high efficiency. But I'm not so sure about climate change. Is that stuff real? You know, sometimes it's warmer, and sometimes it's colder, and how do you guys know that it's real or not? Um, we can run the world on coal. We can build, all our power plants could be coal fired. We can make synthetic gasoline out of coal, and that will take us up to the 22nd century, and we can worry about it then. The problem is that this planet will be uh, 10 degrees Celsius warmer, and it will be perhaps uninhabitable if we do that. So, I'd like so I think it does matter whether global warming is a factor. This is a field where there are thousands of papers that are published. There are, there are blogs, there are email blogs where people actively discuss all of the, all of the uh, critiques. That's why I suggested Bob Watts' book, because some of the critiques that people have made, uh, as if we never thought of them before, was, uh, well, the satellite data on whether we're, the Earth is warming is not consistent with the surface data, or the paleoclimate data, the curve that was shown by Bob, for example, that shows that you had natural variability that was very small compared to recent, that that has mathematical errors in it, that the temperatures that were measured are not indicative of the global climate, but they're Earth and heat islands. I mean, there's a whole series of these questions, and these questions, are very actively, have been in the past, very actively debated. The National Academy of Sciences has convened working groups of the world, world's experts to discuss all of these things. And, in the, and they're all in the public literature. And they've all been addressed to the point where I believe that if Freeman Dyson were to apply the same rigorous analysis that he's done to other problems, he, he would be convinced. I would just say that the reason why some of us call these guys climate change deniers, yeah. it may have a resonance with Holocaust deniers, is really because uh, we don't like the term skeptics because we're all skeptics. I mean, the scientists are supposed to be skeptics, and we don't want to give these guys the, the term skeptics as if we're committed for irrational emotional or financial reasons because we want to get grants so, rather than that. And, so, and that's why we, including myself, call these guys climate change deniers. There is within the terrestrial solar community a conflict between people who believe in co solar concentrators. And solar concentrators can either be used in a thermal sense where you heat up a working fluid and drive a, a heat engine, or they can also be used in photovoltaics where you have some high temperature PV material like gallium arsenide. But they will argue, look, we can get 40% efficiency already with solar thermal systems, and we can solve the whole problem. And the, 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 the issue there is that if you're using solar concentrators, you have to have sun trackers. Each one of these guys has to be you know, tracking the sun individually. And there are a lot of different technologies. There are power towers. We have a whole, whole bunch of flat mirrors that are pointed. The problem in evaluating any of these things is that we can show on paper <coughs> to within an order of magnitude that all of these technologies are plausible. And we can point to some laboratory experiments, very limited, um, and try to extrapolate from there what a full up system is going to be. My experience as an engineer, to the extent that I've actually built stuff, I can tell you that uh, you know, it's a long way from the conception to getting something to actually work. And when you actually build something at a demonstration scale, there are going to be things that happen that you didn't think of. The thing that you thought was going to be the biggest problem may turn out to be not a problem. But something else is going to come. And the biggest problem that we have is that we don't have institutionally a massive research and development program in alternative carbon neutral power. That's why I and 30 of my colleagues wrote this letter to Congress and to congressional candidates calling for a program funded at about $30 billion a year that would be a kind of Apollo or Manhattan project in alternative energy that would go to the demonstration plant stage, understanding that a lot of these things aren't going to work. But that always happens. I mean, technological evolution is like biological evolution. I mean, you have to have mutations. 
Most mutations are unfavorable. But if you don't have mutations, evolution stops. So you need to have a policy where you can't guarantee up front that this is going to work, but it's plausible. And if it does work, it can change the world. Now, we used to be willing to do that kind of stuff. In fact, there are at least four cases that we've studied of presidential initiatives with such massive R&D programs, starting with FDR and the Manhattan Project, JFK and the Apollo program, Jimmy Carter and his energy independence program, and fortunately, in my opinion, cut short by Ronald Reagan's presidency, and Reagan himself's program of Star Wars. If you look at the funding levels in, in 2008 dollars of all of those programs, $30 billion a year is not very much. It's about the level of all those programs. And if you had those programs, <laughs> you would have enough money to do, to, look, let me compare this right now. The amount of money that DOE spends today on energy is about $2 billion a year, and most of that goes into conventional coal and conventional nuclear programs. So I think that this is doable. I think within recent American history, it is possible for a president to make that, to make that commitment. That's not enough. I think beyond that, one of the things that has to happen is the position of Secretary of Energy has to be elevated to that of Secretary of State or Secretary of Defense in stature. And you need to get a guy like Al Gore or Bill Clinton or somebody with political savvy and who's reasonably intelligent to run this agency. Beyond that, I think the next president needs a brain trust similar to FDR's brain trust in what he called the War Production Board. Well, remember, in World War II, we went from the late 1930s, where we were making about 3,000 airplanes a year, to 1944, where we were making 100,000 planes a year. I mean, that's what we're good at, at this country. But this was basically coordinated through the government, but it involved private industry as well as, as the government. We have to figure out how to do the program management and how to make those decisions. And we have to identify the technical and scientific talent and management talent of people who could do it. But I would say these people should be installed in the West Wing of the White House. And they should meet with the President every day with the Secretary of Energy. And that we should be dealing with this problem as if it was the Second World War. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen. But I think if we wanted to solve the energy problem, if we wanted to make a revolutionary change in that, we would have to operate at that level. And we would also have to integrate work by international partners like China and India, particularly since it may be necessary for the United States with American taxpayers' dollars to build pilot plants in India and China for that would be producing carbon neutral power because they're not going to do it. Okay, I said plenty of controversial things. Yes. 